Jesus is interested in the one. Salvation comes to the one. He's that shepherd that was born in Bethlehem, that lived his life in ministry and reaching the one to restore, to heal. His name is Jesus. And he's that shepherd that goes after the one. And I want you to, I want you to hear this. You're the one. So, what's in a name? You know, Shakespeare says, what's in a name? Uh, a rose... And any other name will still smell as sweet. I asked Charlotte what that meant the other day. She said, well, it means no matter what you call the rose, it's still going to smell good. And I thought, well, that's, that's good. I also read, uh, read that the, the reason why sometimes children are, are given a middle name is so that later on in their life that when the, their full name is used, they'll know that they're in trouble. Names have something to do with a lot of different things as far as sometimes it, it represents character qualities that, that is seen, particularly Old Testament passages where uh, a person is named, uh, a child is named a certain name in order to display something prophetically that's going to be happening in the nation, particularly Isaiah's uh, son who is... I'm not, I'm not going to quote it to you, but it's a long name. But it has to do with judgment coming on Israel. There are other things in names. Growing up, did you ever have a nickname? I don't know. I, I don't know why I, why I had that. Um, I remember in ele elementary school, they used to call me Cracker. I don't know. Maybe it was because I was born in Florida. I don't know. But um, just different, different na names, nicknames that happen. Uh, um, very few people call me Donnie. There's only certain ones that call me Donnie. But when Charlotte and I got together, began to get together, she'd always call me Donald. You know, it, it represents something. Your names, names sometimes represent things that some character quality that we have, we give that name. Or maybe the name also has to do with an expectation that maybe our parents had that we were going to become certain things. So we are called that name. A key scripture this morning And it displays a, something about the name Jesus. The angel comes and says, Mary was greatly troubled at his words. And wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son and you will give his name Jesus. Now in Matthew, Matthew's gospel, the name Jesus is interpreted. He shall save his people from their sins. So literally, it's it, the, the character quality or the quality that the name Jesus brings is, is that salvation. He saves. That's the meaning of the name Jesus. He saves. It's not just a quality that, it, that he has. It's embedded in who he is. Salvation. In fact, the... 
the scripture says that, that later on, Mary and Joseph takes Jesus to the temple. And as he's there in the temple, he, they're going to do sacrifice according to the law because he was the firstborn in the family. And this is what happened. There was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was a righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he sees the Lord's Christ. And moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. And when his parents brought the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, now listen to these words. Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light of revelations to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them. And said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel. And to be a sign that will be spoken against. So the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And the sword will pierce your own soul too. So picture this, Jesus is brought with Mary and Joseph, brought, and Simeon picks him up in his arms. And what he declares is that he, this one, this Messiah, is salvation. This baby is salvation. It's almost like a, another name, but, but that's what Jesus means. Salvation. Salvation. But the prophecy that's spoken by Simeon over this child is that this child, you cannot disregard or not respond to him in some way, right? He said that it's, it, he's destined for the rising and the falling of many in Israel. There are going to be those that said that will condemn him. There are those that will do everything to, to hinder what God was wanting to do. And there are those that will believe. But nobody with this child can stand neutral. That's the prophecy. And he, she's... Remind it. He reminds Mary that you're going to see all this happening right in front of your eyes. And it's going to pierce your soul also. He is salvation. Throughout the ministry of Jesus, as he grows up, he goes and what does he do? He acts... Salvation. He does salvation. He restores. He changes people. And everybody that's individual to this Jesus, it's not a group thing. Think about it. In the ministry of Jesus, even though they even though they came to him, for instance, Peter's mother is is healed. Of a fever by Jesus. And it says at that whole night. People were coming outside that door. And Jesus ministered to all kinds of people. That had all kinds of problems. 
demonic as well as physical conditions. All kinds. But what impresses me with that is that Jesus didn't walk outside the door and say, okay, you're all done. You're all healed. You're all taken care of. Boom, done. He could have done that. But that's not what he did. It said he laid hands on each one. He touched everyone individually. He took the time, even though it took all night to do it. He didn't heal or dramatically cast out demons or whatever and a full swoop the whole crowd. He could have. But every individual was important to Jesus. Jesus never did not define a person by his what, it, the, what the problem was or the disease. People did that. Remember the, the person who comes with leprosy to Jesus. And the scripture says, Jesus saw the man. Jesus saw the man. He didn't say, well, there's the leper. He saw the person. That's Jesus. Jesus saw the individual. Salvation comes to the individual. Remember Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus was a wee little... Okay, he climbs up a tree. Why? To see Jesus. Jesus goes by, he looks up at the tree, and he sees Zacchaeus. He says, I'm going to your house today. What happened when Jesus went to his house? He's eating with them and he, Zacchaeus is so impressed by Jesus and with Jesus. It so touches him so much that he says, I'm changing in this moment. I rip people off. I'm going to give back over half of my things to the poor. Ripping people off, I'm going to make amends four times. Jesus' response to this is, praise God that salvation has come to this home. Then Jesus says, the Son of Man come to seek and to save that which was lost. Using that example of Zacchaeus changing, when Jesus shows up in a person's life, is exactly what the prophecy said at Simeon, that people will be changed. You can't stay neutral with him. He is salvation. And he changes people. The individual is important to Jesus. One day, Jesus gave this parable. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you had a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety and nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. And he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, 
that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents. Over the 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Jesus is interested in the one. Salvation comes to the one. He's that shepherd that was born in Bethlehem, that lived his life in ministry and reaching the one to restore, to heal. His name is Jesus. And he's that shepherd that goes after the one. And I want you to, I want you to hear this. You're the one. That he's coming after. And if you, if you have, he have, have never really experienced that salvation of who he is. And have the joy of having him carry you on his shoulders. And heaven rejoicing in this season, this time. Salvation wants to come to your house. There's a struggle in our day. And even within the church. And Peter, in 1 Peter, talks about this. That people will say, where's the promise of his coming? Where's the promise? When He's coming. He's going to come. He's been saying that for what? We know that. Over 2,000 years? He's not here yet. Well, how come? And Peter says, don't think that his lax, his lax is, is... Don't make the assumption that it's not showing up is somehow he's forgotten or his lackness because this judgment hasn't come, that Jesus has not come back. He said, don't do that. Because he, he longs for everyone and as many as possible before he comes again to repent. He's not slack concerning his promise. As some say, want slackness. But he has promised. And he's waiting. Waiting for that last person. I don't know who that is. I'm telling you, it's one. That last one in God's timetable. Because he's waiting for everyone. To find and know him as salvation. But can you imagine? You're sharing with somebody. You're sharing with somebody and they come. And they put their faith in Jesus. Like you know. Finding, finding the shepherd carrying them. And they're rejoicing in heaven. And that one person. Be the last person before Jesus comes back. Think about that. It's about the one. And God is longing. Longing. The Lord gives us space between himself knowing and doing all kinds of things. He allows us space in our free will to choose. To choose. 
He allows us some... Because he could command everybody to just... Oh, you got to love me. You're going to love me. You're going to do this. You're going to act this certain way. No. By the way, that wouldn't be... If he did that, that wouldn't be my experience of love towards him. He'd be doing it because I'm doing it out of duty and not by choice. He gives us space to, to make decisions, to choose, to choose. And the choice is up to us. Will I be the one that opens the door of my heart and allow him to be salvation for me, for you? It's a choice. Just as the prophecy over this child that day by Simeon, there would be this child would be a, a sign to be spoken against. To be one who individuals who will be risen, raised, believe. And those that would speak against that will act against because he reveals the heart of people just because of who he is. Consider today, if you don't know him, if you have never made that choice and say, yes, I'm a disciple of Jesus, I am a learner of Jesus. I want to be and desire relationship with him. He is salvation and he changes us. If you've never done that, please. He longs for you. The one. To allow him in to your life, the one. Will you let him in? There's an incident, and I'll conclude with thought. There's an incident where Jesus is heading towards Jerusalem. Soon after that incident, he ends up going through the gate, riding the donkey, and so forth. On his way to Jerusalem, he weeps over the city. He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if only you knew this day. If only you knew this day. I would have gathered you to myself as a hen gathers the chicken, chicks under her wing. If only you saw it. He says the same thing over one individual who just doesn't seem to see. He says, please see. I'm willing to Put you under the wings. Will you do this? Where he pursues us and he continues to.